We acknowledge and are mindful that Chico State stands on lands that were originally occupied by the first people of this area, the Machupta, and we recognize their distinctive spiritual relationship with this land and the waters that run through campus. We are humbled that our campus resides upon the sacred lands once used to sustain the Machupta people for centuries. This evening, I am very pleased to introduce to you Dr. Sandrine Matizek, Associate Professor in the Department of Geological and Environmental Sciences at Chico State. Dr. Matizek studies the interactions of hydrological, geochemical, and biological processes that control water chemistry at various spatial scales, ranging from the soil column to the watershed. Her current interests also include the fate and remediation of heavy metals, such as mercury, at historic mining sites. The title of her talk this evening, All is Swell for Urban Runoff, Water Treatment in Bioswales, reflects the importance of vegetated green infrastructure systems designed not only for flood control, but also to enhance infiltration and containment removal from urban storm runoff. She is also working with Gateway on a citizen science project, which I believe she will share with us tonight. As previously, Dr. Matizek will be responding to questions posted in the chat. That is, that started uh, back in fall 2015 at Chico State, and that has involved uh, funding from the EPA P3 program, People, Prosperity, and the Planet, and has involved over the years a total of 22 undergraduate and graduate students. So I won't name them all here, but I'm forever grateful uh, for in their, their involvement. Uh, so keep that in mind. Lots of work, lots of hard work from them. So today, that's trouble clicking. Here we go. Uh, today, uh, we're going to discuss a few things. First, we're going to review the unique um, characteristics and challenges of urban watersheds and talk about biofiltration as a management strategy for urban storm runoff. Uh, then I'll present the results of our work on assessing the performance of a local bioswale um, at View College. And a little bit, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit on metal, uh, the, the fate of heavy metals in, in plants in, bio, in this bioswell. We'll conclude on whether these bioswells are working or not, um, and finish with things you can take home and think about doing uh, to help with the, the issues that we're going to discuss today. So uh, as you know, we live on this pale blue dot. Uh, which is made of 70% of water. The, the surface of the earth is, is, uh, is covered, 70% of the surface of the earth is covered with water. But a big challenge is that this water is um, mainly saline, mainly salty, mainly ocean water. Only 3% of water on earth is fresh water. And then to further complicate things, most of the fresh water, up to about 80%, is, is locked in glaciers and ice caps. And we want it there. We don't need it. We don't, we don't, we don't want it to melt. Um, we also have uh, another important slice of this fresh water that is groundwater, 20%, which is somewhat accessible, but not all of it is accessible. So the big challenge here is that of these 3% of water on Earth, only about 1% is accessible easily. And as you look further down on the next pie chart, um, about half of that is, is lakes and reservoirs. And there's only a little bit of it that's flowing, flowing fresh water. So hopefully this, um, this graph, this figure helps you keep in mind that water scarcity, water, water issues um, are not just linked to the spatial and temporal distribution of freshwater resources on Earth, but they, this also helps you keep in mind that if we, if we work on keeping water fresh, uh, the accessible freshwater on Earth uh, to keep it clean and fresh, uh, clean of pollutants, uh, we're going to release some stress in the system and keep keep water uh, available to, to all who need it. So let's focus on one of the major stressors for surface water quality, which is urban land use. Um, our pale blue dot is becoming increasingly crowded. Uh, we are 
It's hosting 7.8 billion uh, people as of uh, 2021. Um, and it, urban land use is the fastest growing land use globally um, at the expense of forested ecosystems, uh, while the global area that is used for agriculture um, is kind of uh, stabilizing or, um, or flattening out. Um, this view of Manhattan can hopefully help you uh, visualize the pot potential impacts of urban land use on the water cycle with the uh, artist rendition on top of pre-New pre York City and then uh, a, an actual picture of New York City. So let's dig into this a little bit more. Um, that, this, uh, this brings us to the, the anthropogenic water cycle. So this is probably a water cycle that's quite different from uh, the water cycle you learned uh, back in school, right? Uh, a little bit more complex. And um, this uh, one really highlights how human activities are altering the water cycle by adding new types of fluxes and new reservoirs for water. These fluxes can be things like dams that, uh, sorry, the reservoirs are, are the new lakes that we create behind dams. And then new fluxes can include wastewater uh, coming out of uh, residential areas or urban centers uh, with first before treatment and after treatment. And then there is storm runoff in urban areas. Uh, and that's the part of this anthropogenic water cycle that we're going to focus on. So I wanted to do a quick poll, here, a quick, uh, quick survey, and I'm going to ask you to use your chat if uh, the, the chat function, uh, we didn't get to quite set up the, the poll function. So if you had to guess, what do you think are the leading pollutants uh, for water in the US? The, the, common, the most common types of water pollution in the US. So I'll be looking at the chat as you, uh, as you as you enter your in, your answers, or you can feel free to turn your microphone on real quick. All right, so I see pesticides, runoff from farm, nitrate, wastewater, oil, chemicals, sediment, pesticides, nitrate, saline. Great, you hit you hit the top three. So we won't do a contest on who's right, who's wrong, but collectively you have identified the leading pollutants in the US, in, in the waters of the US. So excess nutrients, that includes nitrate, that includes phosphate or nitrogen and phosphorus, sediment, and the pathogenic organisms that are associated with raw sewage, for example, or untreated waste. Good job. Uh, locally, uh, that's those, those apply, obviously. Uh, and if you look at the Sacramento River Basin as a whole, uh, you'll find that mercury is, um, is also a, a, a leading contaminant due to our historic um, uh, mine, uh, mining activities and pesticides uh, as well. So uh, this all fits in to our conversation on urban hydrology. Let's see how this information intersects with the in urban environment. Uh, so in urban areas, you, you're probably aware that we have a lot of impervious surfaces, um, which are surfaces that do not let water in, right? These include paved roads, uh, parking lots, and rooftops. So these kinds of surfaces are challenging because they, they deeply affect urban streams, um, so much so that there is the term urban stream syndrome that has been coined here. So let's investigate a little bit more what that means. Uh, let's see. So the, the issue in urban environments is really the, the, the first big symptom of the urban uh, stream syndrome comes from the loss of infiltration. So as the fraction or as land cover becomes in increasingly impervious, it doesn't let water infiltrate. 
And you can see this on this graph, uh, comparing a watershed with natural ground cover, lots of plants, lots of soil, open soil, right? Uh, well, yeah, open land, uh, to a densely urban area, you'll notice that um, the percentage of infiltration drops from 50% to 15%. And instead, it's runoff that increases from 10% to 55%. So water can go into the soil. Instead, it rushes uh, on top of the ground as runoff. And if we look a, a little more deeply into this, uh, you'll notice that um, the, the hydrology of urban streams changes as vegetation is replaced by impervious surfaces. So during a storm event, more of the rainfall becomes runoff, increasing flood risk, and making flashier streams. So this is what this kind of busy graph shows here. Uh, this is the same watershed with two different land covers before and after urbanization. And compared for, you know, in the same situation for the same storm event, you'll see very different runoff and, and stream flow in the urban stream that runs off this watershed. So in an urban watershed, since the water can't infiltrate the ground, it will quickly reach the stream and it will create a sharper peak, a sharper increase in storm runoff. And because water can infiltrate into the ground, it doesn't recharge the groundwater either. And so this creek uh, dries out more, more quickly compared to the non-urbanized or, or more vegetated watershed, which leads to this much broader uh, stream flow here. So this is challenging. It leads to a lot of, of different symptoms or problems uh, under the, the, the concept of the urban stream syndrome. So as we've learned, uh, the hydrology of an urban creek is deeply affected. The creek becomes flashier. And with the increased stream flow during a storm event, there is more erosion, right, which leads to deepening and a widening of the creek itself. As you can see on that lower right picture, the stream banks are going to get eroded and that's going to lead to um, you know, a big change in the morphology of the creek. In terms of water quality, there are greater pollutant loads associated with urban creeks. There are more sources of pollution, more oils, more fertilizer from lawns, um, more pet waste, and, um, and this water flows straight into the creek. Um, so that's, that, that increases that pollutant load. And then as a result of all this, we see an impact on the aquatic ecosystem, which is going to be dominated by more pollutant, pollution tolerant organisms, which are generally not a good sign, not a, a healthy, uh, not a sign of a healthy creek. So that's what we're facing. And you may think that this problem is limited to large cities like the city of LA, as you can see here with the, the, the LA River, uh, which is one, you know, one very channelized and concrete line uh, river. Um, that it's not limited to big cities. We have these issues in our, in our own city in Chico. Uh, so this is, these are pictures that you're probably familiar with in terms of uh, location right next to the Laxon Auditorium um, and, um, and, and the famous pizza joint here. <laughs> uh, on on a, an early storm event in October 2016, uh, there was a whole lot of water right there. And it's not just the amount of water, it's also the composition of this water, right? So right, right around the corner, this is uh, right next to Celestino's, uh, you can see that the storm drain was likely to be uh, clogged or at least overwhelmed, but it wasn't nice clear water. So our team started investigating what this uh, water, this storm runoff was composed of. And um, with lots of uh, dedicated students who did not fear too much rain, um, we, we characterized the composition of the urban storm runoff 
in, uh, in Chico. So over um, 15 storm events at eight different locations throughout Chico, um, we characterized uh, metal composition as well as nutrients composition, which is what you'll see on the next slide. In terms of metals, we saw a really large variability in metal concentrations with dominant metals, um, including zinc, copper, then lead, nickel, and chromium. And you can see that, you know, the, the goal of this graph is really just to show you the, the widespread in, um, in values. We had these, these single dots that were so, so large. And usually these were associated with the first storm event of the season. As you know, we have a, we have a seasonal drought. We have dry summers, right? It doesn't rain in the summer. So those first few rain events in the fall are really um, the, the big issues when it comes to pollutant transport. And um, something uh, highlighted in this uh, slide with the little uh, asterisks and, um, and the number of exceedances is you can see that uh, up to 30% of the water samples we collected for lead and copper and, and a little under for zinc exceeded the environmental screening levels, which are the re recommended levels uh, under the Clean Water Act. So we have a problem uh, even in Chico in terms of high metal concentrations and heavy metals are not uh, not the nicest thing for aquatic organisms or for us to drink. Obviously, we're not drinking this water, but uh, you know, just to make a point here. Uh, in terms of nutrients, we had similar uh, variability. Uh, again, a broad spread of values, whether we're looking at nitrate or organic carbon, as well as ammonium and phosphate, very broad uh, spread of values. Uh, not all of these uh, nutrients have a recommended level. Um, we do have a maximum contaminant level for nitrate, which is 45 milligrams per liter if we were to drink the water. But as far as aqu uh, aquatic ecosystems and their impact, we know that too many nutrients will lead to uh, algal blooms and, and eutrophication down, downstream, right? So that's a problem. All right, so how do we deal with urban storm runoff? We know it's dirty. We know it, it also has impacts on the hydrology, on, on, the, on the magnitude of the flows. So historically, uh, large cities dealt with storm runoff by combining the storm drains, the storm runoff from the streets with uh, sewer systems. So this is called the combined sewer systems. Um, and uh, this is the case for uh, a, a town like a city like Sacramento. So this is a picture of, or a map of downtown Sacramento, um, and you're seeing in the green areas. This is these are the the areas of Sacramento that are that are still combining storm runoff and uh, sewage. So that's a that's a challenge because. It's great for 99% of the time. Uh, all of that water, including storm runoff, goes to the um, wastewater treatment plant. So it's great. But during the 1% of the time when this is not great, we have the risk of releasing untreated sewage into the nearby uh, stream or, or river. Uh, when the system gets overwhelmed during a heavy rainfall event, there is absolutely zero treatment. Everything gets bypassed and dumped into the nearby waterway. Uh, so that's a problem. No, nobody wants to have raw sewage uh, into their waterways. Right? And this becomes problematic, especially as the likeliness of extreme precipitation events uh, can, is, is likely to increase um, with, with climate change. Uh, so that's that's not all. Uh, it's not everywhere. Uh, this is an issue for large cities, especially New York City, deals with this issue. In smaller communities or more recent uh, municipalities, we we deal with urban runoff by separating uh, the storm uh, system with the sewer system, 
and these are called MS4s. So MS4s stand for Municipal Separate Storm System, Storm Sewer Systems, and they are regulated under the Clean Water Act. They've been um, phased in, you know, they've been set up in two phases. Phase one was first main uh, large urban centers, and phase two includes smaller municipal centers. So the city of Chico falls under phase two. And so since 1999, the city of Chico is required to have a storm runoff management plan. Um, it's been evolving over the years. Uh, the latest, um, oh, I forget when this was uh, set up, but not too long ago, 2006, 17, maybe, someone can help me. Uh, so the city now has a, a new storm runoff management plan. And these plans, don't just include reducing pollutants to, I mean, one of the main goal is to reduce um, uh, pollution into uh, storm runoff, but another one is to also handle the storm runoff by uh, doing some hydro modification. And hydro modification sounds fancy, but um, I like to call it biofiltration. Um, it's, it comes in different names, uh, but, one of the, the, the central concepts behind this is to use low impact development strategies to manage storm runoff or storm water uh, that rely on, on restoring natural watershed processes using plants and soil. So maybe you've seen bioswales. They are these vegetated um, depressions in the landscape. They look like a ditch. Uh, and this is the View College Bioswell that I'll tell you more about in a second. Um, and then uh, there are systems like rain gardens. We have one uh, on the Chico State campus. Another option is this um, uh, bioswell as well as porous pavers that are located on the CD lot five right by the farmer's market. And there's the creek, the Chico Creek. Uh, and the new science building on campus uh, just um, establish these uh, systems of bioswells that put all the rooftop water back into the landscape. So the aim of these systems is to slow the flow, reduce the amount of, um, of flood waters, volume of flood waters going into the creek, and also hopefully treat the, treat the water, retain the pollutants. So how does that really work? Some of the key processes uh, in this uh, in this endeavor uh, include filtra infiltration. So obviously we want to let the water in. Sorption, letting pollutants stick to soil particles, as well as plant uptake and microbial uptake or degradation. Uh, so this isn't just a, uh, an idea from, uh, from, uh, from Chico or from the US, it's all over the world, right? Um, it's all over, and uh, an example that's quite famous is the, 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 China, the Chinese Sponge City Initiative, uh, with the goal of having up to 80% of urban area absorbing two-thirds of their rainwater. Uh, it was launched in 2015, and it includes a lot of cities, and, and this kind of visual is very helpful to show you the, the need to really have these areas that can take up a lot of water. Um, it's pretty dramatic. So the big question is, do these systems work? Do they, do they hold their promise? Can they uh, reduce uh, storm flows, the volume of, of storm water going into a creek, an urban creek? And can they also treat the water? So that's what my group at Chico State has been setting out to do, to monitor the performance of bioswells, both in, in um, in storm flow volume reduction, as well as uh, water quality, water treatment. And I will tell you a little bit about the fate, uh, studying the fate of metals in plants, that's called phytoremediation. And what I won't tell you about today is um, we've also been investigating ways to in improve the systems, improve the process by doing, by adding um, different additives to, to these systems like biochar, compost and so on for improving the nutrient removal. So I won't tell you about this today, but we're gonna go mostly over the uh, assessing the performance of the Bioswell at Duke College and a little bit about plants.
All right, so let me show you some fun pictures. Um, the uh, Duke Anish campus invested in a wonderful uh, bioswell uh, back um, a few years ago. I started in 2012 and completed in 2017. It receives the runoff from the main student parking lot, which is about five acres. And it channels all the runoff from this area into five inlets that drain into the bioswell and eventually make it out to, um, to the creek, to Clear Creek. This is the B-Well Bioswell, which stands for Biofiltration Wetland Educational Living Laboratory. And it's been quite a beautiful place for, for studying storm runoff. This is a picture of the entire system that starts all the way back there, drains along the parking lot, and eventually makes its way to the creek. This was as the system was just built in 2017. And as you'll see, it's grown quite a bit. Um, it's got lots of beautiful native plants. Uh, we've also added some uh, stream flow measuring devices uh, in the form of, um, of weirs and flumes. So these are devices that help us collect all the water coming in and measure water level to then uh, have an idea of, of flow, which is volume over time. As, as you can see, that flow can be nasty, right? So this is how we measure stream flow, volume. Uh, and I'm going to show you some results, uh, which are from a very meaningful storm event. This was the first rain uh, of the 2018, 2019 rainy season. And as you all remember, this was as the campfire was still burning. So November 21, November 21st and 23rd. Um, and we collected water at the very beginning of the, of the storm event. So that's the rising limb here. And then at the end of this multi-day storm event. And it was quite an eventful uh, time. Uh, now wearing masks seems to be normal, but at the time that wasn't the case. <laughs> All right, so what did we find? Uh, during the storm event, we saw something that's pretty common. Um, oh, we, we, we've seen this over, over the course of, uh, of several storms where metals were retained by the system at the beginning of the storm. So the system act, uh, acted as a sink for metals during the rising ling, during the start of the storm. And then as the system got wetter towards the end of the storm, metal concentrations actually increased compared between the outlet and the inlets. So what you're seeing here is for each, each type of metal, there is a, a, a large uh, band for the concentrations coming in. And then there's one little bar for the concentration at the outlet because there's only one data point. And what we see is consistently during the beginning of the storm, uh, we see lower concentrations at the outlet. And then during uh, the, uh, at the end of the storm, we see some sometimes higher concentrations. But what's worth mentioning is notice the difference in the scale. We are orders of magnitude lower at the end of the storm. So the concentrations have really decreased. So there's a bit of an, uh, an outlet, you know, an input from the system but overall, the concentrations are much lower. So uh, something we've been wondering is why is the system behaving differently over the course of a storm? And some, this is still up for conversation and discussion among, among uh, scientists. But obviously, there's a strong, um, we have a strong uh, hint uh, that the role, you know, the, the the amount of moisture in the soil is likely to play a, a big role. So as the, as the soils of the system uh, become wetter during a storm event, uh, things become more saturated and less likely to help with uh, retaining pollutants. Now let's look at nutrients real quick. So in the case of the nutrients, um, we have similar graphs where you see the nutrients, ammonium, nitrate, phosphate, and organic carbon. And you're seeing that overall, 
um, the, the system acted as a source, both at the beginning and at the end of the storm. So the exception being uh, ammonium at the beginning of the storm. But otherwise, we don't see a big difference. And sometimes we see an increase between the inlet concentrations and the outlet concentrations. So that's a big problem. And this is becoming kind of a well-known limitation of, the, um, of these vegetated systems. And so that's triggered a whole side project, uh, an important project from one of my graduate students at the moment. We're trying to understand the role of moisture in soil, the water level, and how this can help um, manage nutrients better. So finally, it all comes down to, you know, the, the, the big question is the load of pollutants. And to get to the load, you need to have flow information. So uh, before I get to the load, I'm gonna tell you about floats. Uh, the, another aspect of these systems is, you know, another, another goal of these systems is to reduce the amount of water going into, into the, the creek and to slow it down. And so we really uh, were pleased to see that this system worked really well with a nearly 80% reduction of runoff volumes during um, a March uh, storm. So this water, this 80% volume didn't, didn't just evaporate, right? Where did it go? It infiltrated, it entered the, the shallow, uh, the, the soil and the shallow groundwater system. Eventually it will make it to the creek, but it will take its time. So it's great for flood mitigation, for flood risk mitigation. So that's successful. And here comes the big, uh, the, 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 important, the important summary. Uh, by combining flow information and concentration information, we get the, uh, the amount of pollutant, the mass of pollutant over time. So for each storm event, we were able to calculate the mass of pollutants coming in and the mass of pollutants coming out. And we were able to, to calculate the the reduction of load in, in the system. And as you can see, most of the time, we were above the red line, above the 0% reduction. In some cases, in, during, uh, for, for, so for some of the nutrients, we had a reduction or a negative, sorry, a negative reduction, which means that the system was acting as a real net source for, the, for nutrients. And that was uh, during that first storm event, uh, during the campfire. Uh, so what does that mean overall? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip our metal phyto accumulation story because uh, I'm running out of time, I'm going too slow, but uh, I can tell you later. The, the big bottom line, are we, are we meeting our promise? Uh, is this a swell promise? Well, overall, I would say yes. Uh, the, the, this Duke College Bioswell reduced flood risk by mitigating 80%, nearly 80% of uh, the runoff volumes. It decreased both metal and nutrient loads, metals more efficiently, the nutrients less so, but still, you know, it decreased the nutrients masses by uh, about half. Um, and we saw, that's the part I didn't show you, we saw a seasonal accumulation of metals in the plant roots. Uh, which uh, also has some interesting implications. So what we're continuing to do is investigating the role of soil moisture conditions in columns in the greenhouse. And we're also looking at improving nutrient retention or the and understanding better the fate of nutrients in soil water. And I'm gonna take a few minutes to tell you what, all, what this all means for you. Uh, you, have, you have some power. You can help. You don't have to rely on bioswells in the parking lot of your favorite museum or uh, your favorite campus or your grocery store. Uh, at, at your own scale, at, at the residential scale, there are ways you can, you can help. Um, so this is a list of recommendations adapted from the EPA. And while green roofs may not be necessarily the best uh, option for our climate, we have other options. So for example, you can disconnect your downspouts. Uh, these gutters don't need to go straight into the street, right? Uh, they can go into your landscape. So this is kind of hard to see here, but um, this gutter is 
is hooked up to a perforated pipe, which will go and travel through your lawn and water, water the landscape. And speaking of lawn, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this on the next slide. Uh, the other option is you can capture your own rooftop water. And uh, in our Central Valley locations, a little barrel like this may not do you too good. Uh, it will fill up real quick, right? So it will take a little, a, a larger tank, a larger cistern, but then you can reuse this water to water your, your landscape. And speaking of landscape, planting native plants that are used to uh, being dry in the summer and wet in the winter is a great idea. Uh, and also there is the concept of using permeable uh, surfaces. So there are ways to make hard surfaces a little more friendly to infiltration and let water in. And they, they can look pretty too. So with all this, I'm gonna take a step back and give you some ideas on a few final, uh, a few final things you can do to keep our, keep our water clean. Uh, there's gonna be a great um, community forum uh, that uh, Marsha mentioned, uh, I believe, and I'll be participating in this and I, I look forward to having good conversations with you on, on drought and, and how we can manage our or how we can increase our local water resilience. And this is through the Every Water Drop Impact Project um, through the Gateway Science Museum on May 4th. So stay, stay tuned for that one. And then another citizen science project that was supposed to start this spring and is a little delayed. Uh, so I wanna put this bug in your, in your ear. Um, we're going to have a, an upcoming citizen science project in the fall at Chico State. My colleagues in geology and, and other colleagues in environmental science, uh, we received a fun funding for this uh, fancy instrument called an inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer. And we moved it to the new science building and it's taken, a, a, it's, it's been a, an interesting uh, series of hurdles, but we're there now. Uh, and we're about to be ready to analyze your samples for metal uh, content. So in the fall, we're going to do a drop-off event where you can bring ideally your well water so that we can understand the composition of your local groundwater um, or, or to characterize the composition of our groundwater uh, locally. And we have a website for this now. So uh, stay tuned and you'll, you'll be able to come and visit us. With that, I wanna say thank you to all the students involved, all the funding and the departments and the different campuses, and I will gladly take questions. That's great, Sandrine. Thank you so much. That was a really, really interesting presentation. And um, Wow, I'm, I'm uh, overwhelmed by how much I just learned. That's awesome, thank you so much. You. We already have questions pouring in and, uh, oh, was that a pun? And I didn't even realize it. They're pouring in, Sandrine. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'll... <laughs> good one, good one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if only I had intended it. Anyway, so there's a question about combining some of these um, processes. Uh, can you tell us about, um, ways that um, porous pavements might be combined with biotreatments that can um, uh, work to help improve um, or reduce urban pollution? Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, so generally, these systems are designed based on the, the local constraints, right? One big constraint is space. Not every um, urban center has a lot of extra space. If you think of uh, downtown uh, San Francisco, there's likely a lot less space to go around to build a beautiful, um, a beautiful long bioswell along a street, as opposed to, um, you know, having more compact systems. So I think that, um, I haven't seen too many combined systems, but actually this one picture from, uh, from Calscape combines these porous, paver, porous pavers with a rain garden. So, so I think 
I think there's quite a range of designs and they are all quite unique. And that's another thing that's been interesting in this new field is that uh, the terminology is challenging. Um, there's rain gardens and bioswells and uh, they, sometimes they mean the same thing, sometimes they don't. Um, so I don't see why not. Um, they, they all help in the, for the general same goal, which is to increase infiltration and, and treat pollutants using soils and plants. Um, so I would say, why not? <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, so one of the, um, I, I want to encourage folks to um, uh, type their questions in the chat and um, I'll make sure Sandrine um, responds to them or I'll ask her to anyway. And um, one of the questions that um, has come up is about um, what happens to the metals that are being absorbed by the plants. Um, is there a maximum capacity um, if they absorb a whole bunch this summer or this year, then, you know, will that tap them out and no longer able to, um, to do that work or how does that work? That's a, that, that's a great question. And uh, that's usually the number one concern uh, when I bring this up. Um, so that's why I have this slide here and I didn't get to talk about it, uh, but let, let's look at some pretty plant pictures first. Um, so it is, it is true that we are, you know, we're saying we're going to use soils and plants to remove pollutants. And the first concern that comes to mind is like, oh, wait a minute, you're going to do what? You're going to put this nasty runoff on plants and soils? Or what is that going to do to the plants and, and the soils? So one one first answer or response I have for this is that, well, it's better to put it right there than to rush it to the nearest creek and then hope for the best uh, for the downstream ecosystems, right? And soils and plants have a pretty, they're pretty resilient. They have a, they're pretty robust at being able to handle quite a bit. And it is, it comes down to the question of determining what the maximum capacity is for these systems. And, and that's a very, uh, a very open question that doesn't really have an answer yet. Um, most of these systems are built without that much, uh, of, uh, that much knowledge. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, research question. And so that's what we did here at, uh, at the Be Well Bioswell at Butte College with a, a, a wonder a wonder grad, uh, Gabby Wyatt, who, uh, who transferred from Duke College and uh, finished her biology degree at, um, at Chico State. And she studied the, the accumulation of metals in plants in the system. And she followed the same plants over time, uh, three types of native plants, a sedge, the deer grass, and rush. And over time, what we saw is that there was metal accumulation in the, in, the, in the plants in general and preferentially in the roots. So what you're seeing here is three different boxes for each, uh, for each plant and each metal. Uh, and over time, we're seeing that the October 2018 contents are much lower than the May 19 and generally lower than the October 19. Uh, samples. And so this was also visible in the plant shoots in the above, above ground vegetation, but a lot less. So generally what we're, what we're observing so far is that metals are entering the plants. Uh, they are so far being stored in the roots, not above ground. So that's great to know because um, it has implication uh, it has implications on the management of the system, right? So some of you may know that Butte College is also a beautiful reserve. It's, it's a, an ecological reserve in its own, in, in its own right. Uh, it has lots of deer and lots of rabbits and they graze on the system. So in a way for metals to stay in the roots is great for the wildlife around. But then in the long term, is this root accumulation going to be toxic for the plants? Are we going to have to pull out the plants and replace them with new ones? 
um, in a way, it's easier if the metals translocate and go above ground so that you can mow the plants, dispose of the vegetation above ground um, properly as hazardous waste. Uh, and so far, we're not seeing that. So far, so far, it's staying in the roots, and the jury is still out. Great, thank you. Um, so going back to bioswale bio design, um, someone noted that um, if the bioswale has a snake-like configuration, then it might slow down the water that's flowing across it. But um, if, if there's a lot of water moving over the bioswale, then is there a chance that the bioswale could actually get washed out? Or have you seen anything like that? Maybe not in California, but um, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> so that's a, that's a great question. And it really comes down to the design, right? And, uh, and on that one, I will definitely refer to fellow civil engineers who are, um, who are very much uh, pros at designing these uh, these systems and uh in this uh, this local vials well here uh was uh, well yeah I, I have to give a big shout out to uh, radley ott who used to work for north star and was involved in the design of this of this one uh, but helped us also uh design and and um and and choose these systems uh the, these uh these weirs and flumes to measure our flows so this is an educational system in many ways, including for civil engineers. Um, and so far, we haven't seen, uh, uh, you know, catastrophic uh, storms that overflow uh, that 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 stressed out this this system. Uh, but I'm glad you mentioned the the linear design versus the snake-like design. Um, erosion within the system can be a problem if you have too much slope. And uh, that is why, for example, in that, in that segment of the bioswale, there are these, um, these rock dams that are built here to try to build some steps in, mm -hmm. and help slow the water uh, even further and prevent erosion. So it all comes down to uh, having a good design. <laughs> That's great. I think it's cool that um, there's also learning going on, not just with a solution to a problem, but learning going on in um, your work and that of your students, but also on the on the design side with civil engineering. That's really cool. Um, another person was asking about um, homeowners who have installed water storage systems where they're collecting their rainwater. Um, and I've heard of uh, heard stories about um, who owns that rainwater. And um, have, are you aware of, um, you know, whether local or, or more distant um, uh, controversies associated with this um, in terms of who owns the water and um, what it can be used for? Right, so that's a great question and it's something I should have highlighted in my recommendations or, or ideas on what to do next. Um, obviously you want to check your local and state regulations on what, what you can do with your rooftop, rooftop water, but uh, uh, in the state of California or at least locally it is, um, it is legal to uh, collect your rooftop water. And um, this picture right here is, is uh, from my home. <laughs> and so we, we definitely checked uh, that we could do this. And um, I don't know what the answer is as to who owns the water, um, but I believe that as long as you use this water uh, directly on your property, uh, you are you are safe. You you are you are doing things right, and uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm. I don't remember the fine print, but uh, <laughs> but we can do this locally. I see. Um, I wonder, are there any large scale um, water um, collection um, projects that? might use and or store that water. Um, somebody mentioned the possibility of using it to fight fires or um, I, that would be a huge volume, but I know from collecting our rainwater, you know, one storm and all of our um, containers are full. So right. um, is, is there any consideration of that? 
It's a great question. Uh, I've heard of, I have not heard of this effort for firefighting, uh, but given our our latest trends in fire, I wouldn't be surprised if one if that became a, a strategy uh, that at least would be considered. Uh, the big issue is obviously space storage, right? Um, I know that Sacramento, the city of Sacramento, has installed temporary storage uh, locations to alleviate the stress on their combined sewer system so that they try to, to delay the time when they have to push everything out to the Sacramento River. So yeah, I haven't, you, I haven't heard of that for firefighting, but definitely for stormwater management and mostly for flood control. Um, right. like that. It's okay. a great call. Um, and then a question about your um, sample collection in uh, of the um, stormwater. Um, you showed us um, metals are um, in that water that your students were collecting, um, as well as nitrates and those kinds of things. Can you talk a little bit about um, what are the sources of those metals and, and other compounds? Good question. Uh, I would love to ask that to anyone, but I guess I'm not in class, so I'll, I'll give the answer right away. <laughs> I'm not used to answering questions directly. <laughs> so the main sources of metals are uh, cards. Uh, and obviously any, any, uh, any metal structure in an urban environment. But a lot of these metals, zinc is a common additive in tires, in rubber of the tires. And there is a whole metal uh, wire uh, backbone of tires. I've learned that uh, through, and you can see this uh, after a fire, after uh, an urban fire like the campfire, a lot of the burnt cars had this ream of metal uh, where the tire used to be. Uh, so I learned over this, uh, this project that zinc comes from the wear and tear of our rubber tires. And then obviously any uh, galvanized metal will contain uh, chromium. Um, and then uh, what else? You know, copper is, is prevalent. And then there's also the catalytic converters. I mean, obviously metal parts, um, any, any car, you know, car, car have a lot of metal components. Cars have a lot of metal components. Um, so metal sources are pretty, uh, pretty common in urban environments. And it, it's not just buildings, it's also uh, automotives. Mm -hmm. another, another source, uh, when we think about nutrients, another big question we had or surprise we had initially was the nitrate. Uh, nitrate can be really high in runoff. And it's in a, in a dance, you know, in downtown Chico, it's not fertilizer, there isn't that many green spaces that are going to run off, you know, in front of Celestinos. And so uh, something to pay attention to is that atmospheric deposition can be a source of nitrogen. Uh, so this is the case in, you know, an extreme or a well-known case is Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe, when it rains in Lake Tahoe, there is nitrogen deposition from the car emissions in the Bay Area. Right? The noxes, the nitrogen oxides that are emitted from cars in any urban area will fall down wherever the rain falls, uh, wherever that's transported. And so nitrogen deposition is, a, is a, probably a key source for, for this nitrate here. And then the organic components, the organic carbon, um, this is just kind of a rough measurement uh, of any kind of uh, organic waste. So I would say, you know, pet waste, uh, any food residue or plants. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right, two quick questions related to Paradise and Campfire. One is, do you think that the metals that um, you were seeing in your November measurements, were those related to runoff from Campfire um, down in Chico? That's a great question. And so this uh, data set here is really, really uh, impactful. Uh, we're seeing, you know, this is from the Be Well Bioswell at Butte College. 
the campfire burned right next to, you know, it stopped right before the bioswell. The bioswell was saved by firefighters. Um, so that was a big question we had was, is this unusual? Is this much higher than usual? And I compared this kind of, um, of results with other first flush events. Um, and so I had previous year's data sets um, and it's very much, it's very similar. Um, the range of concentration uh, is the same, was the same. So I didn't see any big difference, but obviously uh, this is just by comparing range of values. Uh, I would imagine that the, you know, the, there was certainly some ash deposition. Oh, right. Okay. And then there's a um, sort of a suggestion or question. Um, do you know as Paradise is being rebuilt, are there plans for bioswales up in Paradise? Do you know? I know that there's been uh, definitely uh, several groups and, eff and efforts who are considering um, uh, lots of uh, maybe non-traditional ways to uh, to, to rebuild or to treat runoff or to manage water. Um, so I don't know if that will be the winning design for, for Paradise, um, but I, I know that it's on people's mind. Um, yeah. Very cool. Well, we'll make sure that they have the opportunity to watch this presentation and educate themselves as they're um, uh, considering different options. But I want to take this opportunity to thank you so much again, Sandrine. We really appreciate you being here and sharing your expertise and interest. Um, and we'll make sure that you get a copy of the chat. There's a few more comments that we didn't quite get to. Um, but thank you so much again. We really appreciate it. And Marsha or Adrian, do you want to take us out? Well, thank you, Rachel. I will say thank you all and uh, feel free to reach out. My email is right here. So um, yeah, I, I can continue this conversation with you on email. Great, thank you again. And Marcia, take it away. And yes, I couldn't unmute for a minute. Uh, yes, our thanks again for very timely, very pertinent topic. And so I just then want to remind everybody that next week we will return again to the topic of groundwater. And Dr. Christina Buck will be here to share with us. And some of you may have noticed in your mailbox uh, a couple of days after our last talk on groundwater, I got a postcard asking me to comment on the Sigma Vina Subbasin Plan. And I think all of Chico got it. So I thought, well, we were right in the game for that. So please come back, tell your friends. And remember, if somebody would like to hear this or if you'd like to hear it again, uh, these are archived on the Gateway Science Museum website. So see you next week. And thanks again, Sandrine. And Thank you.